I'm Ethan, I love muzzleloading. Today we have some proposed rule changes to the Idaho muzzleloader hunting season. The Idaho Fish and Game Commission is looking for feedback from muzzleloading hunters in the state of Idaho here about a proposed rule change about what kind of projectile you can use when hunting with a muzzleloader during Idaho's muzzleloader season. According to a press release released by the Idaho Fish and Game here, the rule change would allow projectiles made of metal or metal alloy and with accuracy tips as well as pressure bases to be used in hunting seasons designated as muzzleloader only. This proposed change, if enacted, would alter Idaho's muzzleloader hunting rules, which right now only allow for a patched lead round ball or an all lead conical bullet in muzzleloader hunting season. Quote, this rulemaking was initiated in response to hunter requests to address the decreasing availability of lead-only projectiles for muzzleloaders and the increased availability of other metal projectiles. The proposed rule change reads as follows. A muzzleloader is only to be loaded with a patched round ball or conical metal or metal alloy projectile with the exception of allowance of accuracy tips and pressure bases. I'm gonna have a direct link to the document of all of the proposed rule changes for Idaho that are being looked at right now. The muzzleloader specific rule that we're talking about here can be found on page 272. In my opinion, it looks like Idaho right now kind of falls under the Northwest legal rules for muzzleloaders, which aren't totally traditional or heritage like we see in Montana and Pennsylvania, but they're also not fully modern like we see in states like Indiana and Georgia. In Idaho and the other Northwest legal rules, you are restricted to a flintlock ignition, a percussion ignition, but you can use an inline muzzleloader if you are using a percussion cap or a musket cap, and the cap is exposed to the elements. In Idaho as well, you cannot use pelletized powder. You have to use loose black powder or a black powder substitute that is loose, no pellets. The primary argument here cited by the Idaho Fish and Game is the availability um, of modern muzzleloading projectiles over all lead projectiles. And I'm really interested in this point because no data is provided to go along with this. And it's really my only hang up um, about the, the reasoning behind this. There are tons of muzzleloading or supply retailers, hunting in general, not even just specifically muzzleloading, that right now will ship to Idaho all lead projectiles. So I'm not personally totally convinced on that argument that all lead projectiles are becoming harder to find or so impossible to find that hunters in Idaho can't use them. We see them being used all over the country. Um, but advocates are saying that this would give muzzleloading hunters in Idaho a greater range of options for hunting. Um, a lot of people cite the ballistic coefficients of some of the modern bullets giving increased accuracy to hunters, which can lead to more ethical shots, uh, you know, which is something everybody wants out of their muzzleloading projectile. We want an ethical kill here when we're hunting with our muzzleloaders. Nobody's arguing with that at all. Um, but the, the availability thing, I'm not quite sold on. Advocates are also pointing out that the Idaho muzzleloader season isn't classified as a traditional muzzleloading season. So they're not really adjusting the muzzleloader rules a whole lot here as far as the efficiency of the muzzleloader itself. When we look at the expanded history and a very high overview here of muzzleloading projectiles, the lead round ball really went out of fashion by the time we got to the Civil War in a lot of muzzleloading arms. We had switched to things like the Minier ball and, and other projectiles rather quickly, uh, especially getting into a lot of the Western big game hunting and the industrial hunting that then led into cartridge arms and things. We got away from the, the rather primitive in this regard, lead round ball pretty quickly. So the theory here is that a modern muzzleloading projectile with what the fish and game here is calling a pressure base isn't that far of a stretch uh, when we look at muzzleloading history. Those against the proposed rule change are a lot of folks out there that care and want to see traditional muzzleloading preserved. They see the state muzzleloader hunting seasons as a means for that to be preserved by enforcing this kind of restricted nature onto hunters across the state.
I agree with that sentiment in states where it is classified as a as a traditional muzzleloading season. I don't know though that that argument is going to hold water here in Idaho just because it's a big hunting state uh, for the Western United States. And a lot of times we see the muzzleloading or the hunting industry itself getting its way here. There's very obviously uh, an advantageous thing here for bullet manufacturers to see this rule change implemented. And that argument that they're bringing to the table, if they're at the table here, uh, is gonna, <laughs> to the Fish and Game Commission, is gonna say, look, we're, if you open up the bullet options, you're gonna see more tags or, or more licenses being sold because you're making it more accessible, which brings in more hunters, more revenue, uh, which is obviously something the Fish and Game Commissions care about. Back to the historical argument here, you know, Idaho is pretty far west in the United States here, but it is still tied to muzzleloading history. We did see muzzleloaders getting out to Idaho in very early parts of the United States here before we converted to cartridge arms. And I, I do think it's awesome that there are so many muzzleloading enthusiasts in Idaho hunting and enjoying their traditional muzzleloaders here, not pushing them to the side that the, at all. And I love muzzleloading viewer Matthew wrote in to make me aware of this story, which is why we are bringing it here to you today. Matthew says here, in full transparency, I wrote in opposition to this rule change because I think Idaho has the best rules when it comes to muzzleloader hunting, at least out here in the West. Regardless of where you fall on if you care about this, if you want it imposed, or if you don't want it to, to go into effect, Idaho Fish and Game has an open comment period about this proposed rule change that is running through October 25th. So if you wanna make your voice heard, and I think you should, uh, you need to write in to the Idaho Fish and Game here and let them know what you think about this proposed rule change. I will have the Fish and Game contact information in the video description. It will be the second thing below the link that takes you to the proposed rule change so that you can read it for yourself. It's a bit of a side note on this, but it's something that we continue to see in these Fish and Game Commissions or Department of Natural Resources or Department of Wildlife proposed rule changes and how they look at things. And I wanna talk briefly here about terminology and why it is so important when it comes to these fish and games or these hunting regulations from state to state. Because of the way the United States is structured, we don't necessarily have swathing federal rules on what is what for each of these seasons. Each state is able to dictate what they want to have permissible in each season. I'm not arguing that at all. I think that's really great. The more power granted the states, I think in general, the better. But when it comes to these hunting seasons, it's easy for us to get tied up in terminology and definitions because there are just about 50 different ways for all of this stuff to be described. In Pennsylvania, you have a traditional flintlock only season in late December. In Montana, you have what is defined as a heritage muzzleloader season that cuts you off at pre-1890 era traditional side lock muzzleloaders with traditional projectiles. To me, based on those the terminology and the definitions used in states like Montana and Pennsylvania, it would be an encroachment for them to open up to modern inline muzzleloaders to have telescopic sights or optics and to have modern projectiles during those seasons. But the water gets a little bit murky when we're trying to sway public opinion when you have a state like Idaho here that has these Northwest legal rules. There's nothing in Idaho's fish and game rules about their muzzleloader season that aligns in any way with it being set on a historical basis. And I think that's where we have issues as a community trying to sway people towards more traditional muzzleloaders for their hunting seasons because those that we're trying to sway or convince to get into traditional muzzleloading on the hunting aspect of it aren't being given that information at the fish and game level. So to them, it's not even entering their thought process if that makes sense. I'm not, not advocating at all for traditional muzzleloaders or traditional seasons. I want that, like I said, in all 50 states. But I want us as a community to start considering the terminology and the definitions being used by the culture in the hunting, or the hunting culture in the state that you're in, as well as your governing body 
of the hunting rules and regulations here. Along these lines, through the second half of the 20th century, we saw the traditionally focused muzzleloader seasons being kind of an automatic steward for the sport. And this is something I'm seeing at local clubs, at events, um, and talking to people across the country involved in muzzleloading here. F for the last 50 to 70 years or so, there were things in place that naturally led people to muzzleloading, whether that's the education system in the state or in the country, or the muzzleloader hunting seasons in the country that at the time didn't have any other options but traditionally focused, you know, kind of pre-1890-ish designed muzzleloaders. Those limitations of both the market and access to other things in the market naturally funneled people into an interest in muzzleloading. And over the last 40 years or so, and I'd say really dynamically over the last 20 years, we've seen a shift away from that. And we've started to really lose traction inside those what used to be natural cultural funnels into history and muzzleloading and hunting. And we're seeing that across a variety of different areas, but we're focused here on talking about the muzzleloading section specifically. So when we're talking about these muzzleloader hunting rules and regulation changes, I bring this up because those market limitations that we saw in the 60s and 70s no longer exist. You have options of other kinds of arms and other means to hunt than traditional side lock style muzzleloaders now. So the muzzleloader seasons from the state fish and game commissions have altered to accommodate the market, not necessarily muzzleloading culture here specifically because it's such a small niche that we're dealing with here. So we as muzzleloading enthusiasts have lost a rather large funnel, if that makes sense, into muzzleloading as these state game commissions have shifted and moved with the industry and the culture around hunting. This is something I wanna talk about a lot more. It's one of those things that I'm kind of ruminating on in my head, trying to figure out how to talk about it, but I just wanted to bring that, kind of throw that out here as a, a brief idea. Let me know what you think about that idea of cultural funnels and how it's changed over the last 50 years, we'll just say, as a ballpark. I feel like there's something there um, that can help us communicate with the larger American culture as a whole and maybe think about and adjust how we're promoting muzzleloading to get more people involved without those previously existing cultural funnels. If we're going to make strides towards having some kind of heritage or history focused muzzleloader season in each and every state, we need to get on board on the same level as much as we can here with the variety of definitions that we have out there about the what and the why and the words that we're using to argue for those points. Personally, I think it's great that Idaho is still tying their muzzleloader hunting season with the projectile back to some historical projectiles that give you some more limitations compared to the modern muzzleloaders and modern arms that are out there. But I think we have to recognize the machine that is that industry pushing hard for getting more and more open access. Uh, it's been a fear for many years that Pennsylvania's flintlock only season is going to get opened up to other kinds of muzzleloaders because of that hunting industry push. Um, I hope that we don't see that. I don't think there are any signs of seeing that right now. But this just kind of goes back to get active in your state and get active in what you want to see, both with your state hunting regulations as well as your local and community governments. Um, it's just kind of a sweeping term right now because we feel that we're a little disconnected from the rules and the rulemaking process that governs us, um, but we can start to alleviate that if we get active. And I think if we get active in that process, even just starting with the muzzleloader rules and regulations here, that we can start to see some of the changes that the community has talked about seeing for quite a while now, and we just haven't started to see happen yet. That's all I've got for you this week. Once again, make your voice heard. If you're in Idaho, make your voice heard about this. If you're not in Idaho, keep track of the other hunting rules and regulations that are happening in your state. Get involved and, uh, and be a good steward of the muzzleloading community here to make sure this continues for generations. I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.